So it's Ask the Doctor time. Dan, how are you? Very good, thanks Steve. Yourself? I'm very good actually. Fighting off those winter colds, which is good. And uh, um, you know, it's always amazing me how you doctors have loads of people come in with colds and flus and you, you fight them all off and you know. And... Well, certainly during my, particularly during the first few years of being a GP, I think I was pretty pretty ill most of the time during <laughs> winter. You know, I think it's my mum as a school teacher always used to report to me that, you know, in the early days of a teacher's career, yeah. they uh, they get plenty of colds. It's a pretty miserable time. But you you bet guess you get to a point where you've had them all. I think. Probably, yeah. 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 And loads of vitamin C I always think just helps defence. Anyway, that wasn't one of the questions. <laughs> where, how I went on to that, I've got no idea. Uh, let's start there with some of your questions from, from this week. And this one uh, resonates with me a little bit. Uh, I have an underactive thyroid. I don't. Uh, Eve does, so does my wife, that's why it resonates, but uh, Eve says I have an underactive thyroid, is there anything I can do to my gut health that might help? That's a good question. It's a great question. So I think, you know, we we look at, talk about gut health and the microbiome and uh, the, the amount of bacteria that live in our our, our cell uh, in our guts and you know we we find statistics as any I think anywhere between the same amount of cells as are in our bodies or in our, our bacteria in mm -hmm. our guts up to something like 10 or 20 times the yep. amount as well so mm -hmm. depending on where you read and it's been a huge area of science over the last 20 20 years more papers being published about that than yep. than ever before but really in terms of, and, and actually, yes, in terms of thyroid disease, yep. there are associations. A lot of thyroid disease is to do with an autoimmune mm -hmm. condition that, that basically attacks the thyroid. Yep. Uh, and we know that there's relationships between these autoimmune diseases and the gut microbiome. But actually, I think the question was, what can I do? Yeah, is there anything I can do to my gut health that might help? So it looks like Eve's already got an underactive yeah. thyroid. What steps can she maybe do? So first of all, I think what you're saying is that it, it probably is related to the gut because it's not mm. most likely an autoimmune disease. Yeah. Um, so it probably does relate to the gut. So, but what can we do about it? Yeah. I think this is the difficulty because just because we're having this huge growth in research about the microbiome, does that mean that we've got specific things that we can do for people and the answer is probably not yet yeah. really it's a very very difficult to say there's definitely yeah you can do this and it will help now i know, you know the other day you used to talk to me uh, first of all i want to ask how does iodine relate to uh, an underactive thyroid mm. and then the other day when you were talking to me about the fact that in many countries they actually put a lot of iodine in their salt but mm. we don't in the uk yeah so iodine is important because uh, is an essential nutrient because we need it to make thyroid hormones and uh, apparently 40% of the world's population mainly in developing countries are at risk of developing um, uh, are low iodine levels and developing thyroid disease because of it. Mm -hmm. Most of the um, disease in the in developing world is to do with um, autoimmune condition yep. but a lot of it in the developed ping world is to do with um, iodine deficiency right. uh, and certainly a lot of countries have put in iodine into the salt mm -hmm. in order to do that they put iodine into the salt in the states uh, but we don't over in the UK we used to but we don't anymore um, that, do you know roughly when that stopped because I all of a sudden know. I seem to know lots of people mm. that have underactive thyroids my so, wife um, uh, one of our TV presenters on Gems TV, mm. uh, one of their godparents to one of my kids has got it. Mm. Nearly always seems to be female, mm. well, from my experience, I don't know if that's yeah. the case, uh, but it nearly always seems to be female, but it seems to be getting more and more prevalent. Yeah, um, so is that because, you know, my question would be what's causing it? Is it because autoimmune diseases are getting more prevalent, which is quite possible, uh, uh, or whether we're, you know, is iodine deficiency? So, I mean, theoretically, you know, me, you know, good sources of iodine in the diet are, are classic fish, yep. meat, and dairy. You know, yep. which you know, we're obviously big fans of here mm -hmm. uh, at Primal. But but you know, should we be using um, iodine in, in our salt? I mean, I've certainly got some at home that I use as well. I know when we went up to to meet David Unwin in uh, in his home. Uh, 
earlier in the year to do a bit of an interview. It's definitely a part of the I Die sold really? on, on his. Uh, <coughs> and how do we find that? Find it in the supermarket. It's in the supermarket. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah, absolutely. The tricky thing comes with. You know, it's good for preventing iodine deficiency thyroid disease, but actually, if you've got thyroid disease, it's not necessarily going to help you, and that's right. where it becomes a bit of a grey area. So, so more on yeah. the prevention, not necessarily the cure. Yeah, more on the prevention, not necessarily the cure. And if it's thy if it's autoimmune thyroid disease, it's probably not going to be the you know the answer necessarily to that yeah okay it's interesting because we uh, developed a, a, a sea kelp product which is obviously rich in this rich source of iodine mm -hmm. um, and my wife's taking that at the moment also uh, you know looking at probiotics and things like that mm. and we haven't been able to get rid of the thyroid problem yet mm. but you know it's early days you know maybe yeah. it takes time yeah maybe it's something you can fix maybe it's something you'll never fix no absolutely I mean it'd be it would be great wouldn't it my mum suffers with it as well um, to be able to say that there's to find out what specifically is causing mm. this and you know if the microbiome and and that really does hold the key to you know the immune diseases which it may well do yeah whether we can develop specific things for that in the future i don't know but i don't think there's anything there at this moment that i know of and, and that's something we keep saying a lot of isn't it you know it's kind of watch this space mm. with all the research around the microbiome because it's hugely complicated mm. when there's so many different strands uh, 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 of healthy bacteria and not healthy bacteria. Mm. It's so complicated, you know, yeah. so just keep watching this space. And it could be um, that things like iodine, that things like getting the microbiome sorted may eventually be able to solve the problem. But let's, we'll keep telling you what we research and what we find out. I think the science um, is incredibly difficult to do in this area. So we're, we're developing scientific techniques that allow us to look at not only the microbiome, but all the other ohms in the body, the genome, yeah. the proteome, and how these all interact together. Because it's only by studying it across the mm -hmm. entire body that we're gonna find the answers for this. Maybe and maybe you just, I uh, always try and stop you doctors when you go to technical words mm. that most of us won't understand. What are the other ohms then, or biomes? So, I mean, the obvious one would be the genome, which yep. is the name we give to all the genetic material. Yep. And we're looking at all how that, how our microbiome and the gut bacteria yep. interact to basically to produce um, changes in how we express our genetics, okay? So we don't just necessarily, you know, everybody doesn't just necessarily express all the all the genetics in mm -hmm. the same way yeah. or our environment and toxins that come in mm -hmm. that will affect how our bodies produce proteins from our DNA structure and so it, it all interacts basically and so we can't just study the microbiome yep. itself and mm -hmm. the gut bacteria we have to study across the different parts of our body and how they all interact, the immune system, all the proteins that are in our body, what's binding to those proteins. You can see how, yep. just talking about it, <laughs> I'm sure people our eyes are just glazing <laughs> over going, well, what's he talking about? And it, it's, yeah. it's really that complicated. And so science has got to develop techniques to be able to do that sort of an analysis if we're gonna move this forwards. And uh, also there's, there's a lot of people think, oh, underactive means that you're gonna be, you know, hugely <laughs> overweight and things like that. My wife was petite at the time, that's why a lot of doctors missed it. Mm. And, and, and there, there aren't the steadfast rules that we all thought many years ago. And also one thing is, it, it, it tends to be more, we see uh, in females, but also it normally there's a, like a, a catalyst to the event that starts it. And it's normally around stress, you know, maybe you moved house mm. or had a baby or you know, some personal tragedy. It seems to be related like many diseases around stress and mm. that, that kind of then fits in with the, the immune system again, because you know, break down yeah. the immune system. So anyway, what's this space? Uh, the answer was, what, what can you do? Uh, you could probably just, maybe check you get enough iodine in, in your diet. Um, I have a, a great idea. I, I didn't even know you could buy salts with them in, so I'm going to sort of look for those uh, in the supermarket. Mm -hmm. uh, you can buy sea kelp tablets. Uh, we, we have one. And also just do everything you can to look after the microbiome. Thank you, Eve. That was a great question. Um, right. Another brilliant quest, quest, uh, question from Jennifer, who's 36. I like mm -hmm. when they put their age on. <laughs> what are the risks to my unborn child from an X-ray that isn't directly exposed to my abdomen? Okay, good question. Mm. Theoretically, and stress the word theoretically, very low. Yeah. Okay, so we'll use 
things to cover mm -hmm. the area to set, you know, even if you say you're having your shoulder x-rayed, yep. you'd still have lead all over you in order to try and prevent any overspill uh, radiation that may be coming out the side of the senses in order to, uh, you know, to prevent that harm. So, but the reason I say theoretically is because we can't do science in this area. Yep. You can never set up a study yep. to say, we're going to look at the expo you know, the risk of mm -hmm. x-rays in pregnant women, mm -hmm. okay? Because it just wouldn't get through an ethics committee. It would never be ethical yep. to do that sort of science. And that's one of the reasons we, get s we have such little information about the safety of medications in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. It's because you can't, do, you can't study pregnant <laughs> women as part of your drugs trial. Right. So, you know, we, we're going off mainly anecdotal evidence, yep. which is one of the reasons we generally say, look, you know, we think this medication may be safe during pregnancy but honestly we don't know because we've not got the studies to do it uh, and we never have the studies to do it. it's just not ethical has x-rays changed at all over the years in in the way they're done to make them potentially less harmful or the doses less or or is it pretty much the same as it's been for many years <clears throat> as far as I know it's been the same I'm not a radiologist yeah. um, so but the biggest change really in, in x-ray technology recently has been the switch to digital. You right, know, we remember yeah. seeing the, the consultant with a board, a light yeah. light board and putting the x-ray up and everybody gathered around. Well, it's gone pretty yeah, much these yeah. days and all those have been have disappeared from the hospitals and it's now all, all digital really. So, so the advent of digital technology, it's been quite an interesting one actually because yeah. you don't have to see the x-ray there and then. And in fact, what we've God is people who are, you know, could be the other side of the world, yeah. analysing people's CT and X-ray scan results mm. uh, in order to provide that service about what's going on, really, and that's uh, that's fascinating. I mean, it's an amazing question, and hopefully, I didn't scare you in the book when I wrote that. You know, I, I used to get fed up every time I go to the doctor, the dentist. Every time they go, let's take an X-ray. I went, no, you had an X-ray last year. You're not mm. having another one now. Mm. I don't feel like I've got any problems. If you can't find anything, I yeah. can't feel anything. You know, so I try and avoid unnecessary x-rays, yeah. but you know, if you've hurt yourself uh, and you know, pain can lead to stress, you know, if you break your arm, hurt your shoulder and you're pregnant, uh, you have to take a more of a holistic approach to it and go, well, yeah. hang on a minute, pain causes stress, that's going to put stress on the baby, so I need to get out of pain. Yeah. So don't not have an x-ray no. if, you, you know, if you think you really, really need one, but try and avoid maybe some unnecessary of ones course, like yeah. the dentist while you're pregnant. Yeah, of course. And and it's always about the risk and benefit, you know, and especially we're always weighing up the risk and benefit of everything. That's one yeah. of the key things we do all the time as, as doctors. And, you know, we'll be saying, like, well, what's the potential risk? And do you really, really need this x-ray? You know, do you need a routine dental x-ray mm -hmm. during pregnancy? Probably, Probably not. not. Yeah. It can wait. Yeah. But if you've got significant pain in a certain area or, you know, we're trying to treat something, then you may need that x-ray and then you're weighing up the benefits. Absolutely, you know, the question was very specific about not exposed to the abdomen. Yeah. Absolutely, x-rays that are exposed to the, the an unborn baby yeah. is a bad idea, okay? Yeah. The, you know, if you ever see an x-ray with a, a, an, a baby, that's the x-ray that should never have been taken, right. okay? There are examples of these around yeah. that have been taken of abdomens where they have not known they've been pregnant, yeah. and so you will see x-rays if you go and Google for them, yeah. but this is not, it should be a should never happen. event. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess it's like all things, you know, when, when you're uh, pregnant and, and, and uh, you know, you just be a little bit more cautious on everything you can. So definitely know on to answer the question, uh, try and avoid them of the uh, abdomen, but also just be that little bit more cautious on everything. You know, watch the food a little bit more. I've got seven kids, so my, my, my wife's been through five in the last few years, and you just take a little bit more caution on everything, a little bit more caution on your diet, a little bit more caution on, you know, uh, the creams you're using and toxins and everything. Mm -hmm. Just everything you can without becoming paranoid about it. Because again, you become paranoid, you become stressed, become stressed. That's not helpful either. But uh, great question, quite, quite a short one there though, uh, Jennifer, great question. Uh, and the answer is, should you have x-rays of the abdomen? No, everywhere else, you just weigh the pros and, 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 and the cons up. Mm -hmm. Right, next one from Margaret. Uh, I suffer with arthritis. Both pain and stiffness during the night are affecting my sleep. 
but I'd rather not take painkillers. What else would you suggest? Oh, okay, so, so there was some national guidance produced about osteoarthritis yeah, in 2014, which did a really detailed look into what is the evidence for various treatments uh, to be treating osteoarthritis. Now we say osteoarthritis, which would be, you know, age-related degeneration of the bones, can affect the hands, can affect the spine, hips, knees, these are the very, very common sites that arthritis affect, and it, it causes a lot of misery. Very important that we're not talking about things like rheumatoid arthritis mm -hmm. or any of the other arthritises here. So we'll just talk about osteoarthritis. And right now, should we, should we clear the, the main differences between the yeah. different types? Yeah, so so things like, so oh, let's start with osteoarthritis, this age-related degenerative yep. is very often the reason that people will have hips and knees and shoulders replaced. Yep. Obviously, if you've got it in your hands, you know, maybe you've done a manual job all your life and there's a bit of wear and tear there. Yep. Can't do finger joint replacements, yep. as far as I'm aware currently but so you know there we'll is be a, printing finger part replacements eventually probably probably but not yeah just yet. but not yet <laughs> so um, so these are that's that kind of thing so rheumatoid arthritis again we're back to a, an, an immune dis yep. system problem yep. where your body is attacking its own joints there are also a lot of other similar but less common um, rheumatological rheumatoid yep. uh, diseases that, that kind of have a similar impact um, or things like where you've got an infection of your joint which is very very rare uh, but does happen which we call a septic arthritis so these are the main different mm -hmm. types of arthritis but we're talking about straightforward joint pain that's very very mm -hmm. common here so the number one thing you can do is exercise okay, okay? and there's actually a good evidence for both localized muscle strengthening mm -hmm. and general aerobic fitness. There's okay. an evidence base for both of those, okay? So, you know, think about it with your, you know, any joint, it's not just that, in order to give that joint stability and keep pain away from the joint, it's not just the actual joint itself, it's everything that goes around that joint in terms of the muscles and things sure. like that. Yep. So we know that strengthening muscles will really, really help with that. Secondly, I think even after the development of arthritis, yeah, so in some ways, some people might say that's counter intuitive in the sense that, well, I've got pain in my hand, but you're actually saying, well, no, sort of get through it and try yeah. and exercise it a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Arthritis Research UK, their website's got loads of different leaflets that you can print off in order to um, get you know, particular exercises for particular areas. And they're really well designed, actually. They're not, it's not like weightlifting kind of <laughs> stuff. It's not like bodybuilding. Yeah. Yeah. It's really simple. Uh, you know that anybody throughout their life can do sort of light resistance work yeah, yeah light resistance work just you know stretching and and strength but also you know go and see a physiotherapist you know yeah. many in many areas yeah. you don't even need to go and see your doctor to go and access a physiotherapist yeah. ask your gp reception can i self-refer yep. to a physiotherapist about my you know my knee problem and actually you know we Surgery will be the last thing we come and talk about sure. here. It's the, it's the last thing that people really, really want to do. Mm -hmm. There is a time and a place for it, clearly, but one of the ways that, one of the things we like to do is try to prevent it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And actually, one of the things that really helps surgery become very, very successful is to have good muscular strength around the joint. One of the things that causes people a lot of problems when they have hip and knee replacements is they've left it so, so long trying to put it off, is that the muscles around have wasted because they've not been used very much because of the pain. And actually, these people tend to have worse outcomes yep. after their surgery. I did the very same thing. I broke my leg yep. uh, in 1999, and because I was so busy at work, I was on crutches, so I kept putting off and yep. putting off and delaying yep. uh, the operation, and my leg just went to jelly. And then yep. after I had it repaired, it took me another year then to get my strength back in the leg, but yeah. sometimes you need to address it there and then. Absolutely, and one of the things we do see when people break their legs and they're on crutches is they, um, you know, they get pretty much a complete wasting of the, the muscles mm. because they're just not using yeah. them. So it's important that even if you've broken your leg, you know, that the, the doctors will give you advice to keep uh, moving them and, and actually uh, certain exercise that you can do to maintain that muscle bulk because, yeah. you know, we, get, we gain a lot of muscle quite easily in the first 
you know, 20, 30 years of our life. After that, it's all downhill in terms of, and you're, and you're fighting to get mm -hmm. that muscle back. So this is one of the things that we say about strength training and maintaining muscle strength throughout the um, throughout your life course and that you know you should be from 8 to 80 you should be getting some form of mm -hmm. resistance training throughout Agreed. your life but that wasn't the question that was about the <laughs> arthritis <laughs> so no, no, you, I mean, you kind of answered it in, in, mm. in, in, in maybe not the whole answer yet but mm. um, you know exercise so yeah, she says absolutely. what can we do to take away the pain in the night she wakes up with the pain uh, should she take doesn't really want to take painkillers mm. so the first thing is maybe well let's try and do a bit of exercise yeah, yeah. Um, so an aerobic exercise was the other thing and that kind of teaches ties nicely into weight loss okay yeah. so hips and knees if that's where your or hips knees and spine the kind of main column down your body where you're mm -hmm. transferring weight weight loss is yep. going to be a really really helpful thing to be taking the strain off those aching joints and actually a lot of people are trying to lose weight so that they can have joint surgery because your joints will wear out quicker if mm. you're overweight. This yeah. is one of the many things that is bad about being overweight. And um, and yeah, you, you're going to put a lot more strain through those joints. And so taking the weight off is going to help. That's all, all, also why, I mean, when I broke my leg the first time, I was definitely overweight. Mm. Uh, my son's had both knees uh, fixed and he was overweight, still trying to do sport. And mm. so I would say that if you're overweight, the first thing you've got to do is lose your weight and then go and walk a lot before mm. you even try and do you know, other things like play football or tennis, yeah. get walking, get the weight off, don't risk putting too much weight onto those joints. Yeah, I'm always cautious about, you know, this, you know, new year kind of thing is, yeah. you know, let's go and start a diet and hit the gym and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, and it's all very honorable. And, you know, it's great that people want to establish exercise. I'm obviously very pro exercise, sure. but taking too many things on at once, yeah. especially if you're going to do high impact running and things like that, when you're carrying significant extra weight can cause damage in the longer term, mm -hmm. can cause damage in the longer term. Um, I'm going to go back yeah. to Margaret's question. Mm. Uh, a little bit more. Um, I want to ask, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm bad to say there are, there are rather than taking painkillers, try things like turmeric, uh, which is sort of a natural way, mm. a natural painkiller has certainly worked for a lot of people I know. Um, Omega-3, vitamin D, all those are related yeah. to, to, to potentially uh, removing some pain. Uh, but also, what about water? Does dehydration, I, I've, I've certainly found recommended to my father-in-law a lot because I said, how much water do you drink? never drinks water, uh -huh. other than his coffee, his tea, and, and his yeah. beer. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so one of the things I've got to do is drink a load more water, and yeah. whether it be uh, uh, you know, a placebo effect or what, he said it's definitely helping me. Good. So okay. would hydration uh, help with I think, do you know what, I think, I don't know if there's any evidence for that, but, you know, there's, we, you know, there's lots of things that people are finding that, that really help them and how much of that is the placebo effect and yeah. how much of that not the effect and I'm always I'm always studying studying trying to study the evidence and one of the yeah. things that the you know in terms of commonly used treatments for um, arthritis is the uh, what's it called the the supplements chondroitin and glucosamine have right. you come across those not necessarily for, for arthritis so no, these are you know they're supposed to be the, the well they are chemicals that are help with the lining of the the articulating joint surfaces mm -hmm. and one of the theories is that if you take these tablets then you're re you're replenishing, essentially replenishing those uh, okay. areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but actually, we have looked at the evidence for that, and um, in placebo-controlled trials, nothing. Right. Okay. And so you think, well, why is that? And then I think, well, hang on a second. Just because you're taking something in to your gut that's that's in your joint, what makes you think it's going to get there? To there, to the right place, <laughs> to the it? right place, yeah. in order to replenish that area. Yeah. So I think that was one of these things that, but again, you will see people coming in and saying, "Oh, you know, glucosamine that completely changed my life." Yeah. Well, the evidence shows it didn't work, <laughs> but you know, people <laughs> will say that you know, so placebo effect. Yeah. It, 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 it is real and it is powerful. So I don't know whether the water is you know a placebo effect mm -hmm. or whether it's real, but the evidence base says that. Uh, glucosamine and chondroitin don't work, but you'll no doubt be people watching who will be on those medications or, or supplements for that. 
who are having really great results just because yeah. that's the way things work. Well, Margaret, I hope that's uh, in some way uh, answered your question. Uh, exercise is, 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 is brilliant and potentially some, some other things uh, too. Uh, and of course, uh, the question again just was about uh, how do you get to sleep at night, but doesn't really want to take painkillers. Try things like gym to see if they work for you. It, I'm not saying it'll take all pains away, uh, but certainly uh, back to my father-in-law, Keith, uh, you know, he takes, um, uh, drinks a lot of water now and a lot of turmeric and seems to help immeasurably. Right, next question. Uh, Hmm, kind of ask the doctor, I guess. Uh, with edible oils, uh, e.g. flaxseed or coconut, can you cook them, uh, cook with them, or are they better added after cooking, says Eileen. Okay, so, edible oils. Um, so, yeah, really, I think they are different, and you have to be very cautious about which ones you use for which. Some things are really good. Uh, so some things get damaged, basically, yep. by high temperature cooking. Agreed. And particularly the one that you referenced there, which is flaxseed, yep. does get yep. damaged, okay? So never cook with flaxseed yep. oil, okay? Um, so that is definitely a no-no. Um, just because the way the chemical structured in it, it makes it very reactive mm -hmm. and therefore you can get damage when it's cooked. Um, so use it in salad dressings and things like that but never cook with it. Also should be in a dark bottle. I believe yours is served in yep. a dark bottle. So very often when you go around a supermarket and you see things in different colored bottles, same with wine and that, mm -hmm. it's because they get damaged by light. Yep. So red wine's the same. If you actually served it in light colored bottles rather than green or dark or brown bottles, mm -hmm. Uh, the light would react with it and turn it a colour. I think it only changes the colour with wine, mm -hmm. but it kind of makes it all black and doesn't look yep. very nice. Uh, but yeah, that's why bottles are different colours in the supermarkets, why your olive oil tends to be in green bottles and darker coloured bottles. And that's why we just use different coloured bottles, because light will react. Um, the other side of things, coconut oil, very unreactive, it's a saturated fat, which means it hasn't got any of the double bonds in it, which means that generally, saturated fats are a lot more stable at high temperature. Mm -hmm. Coconut oil, I believe, is one of the best that's been studied for high temperature cooking. So, you know, deep fat fry is probably a very expensive way to deep <laughs> fat fry. <laughs> very expensive way to deep fat fry, yeah. but probably one of the best ways yeah. of going about deep fat frying from a safety point of view. Other things, are like beef dripping lard yep. that's it's still available in the supermarkets. Yep. You've just got to hunt behind all the yep. um, cholesterol lowering <laughs> rubbish creams and rubbish and things like that that's not really food or not really edible yeah. if you ask me. But it is there because I bought some last night ready for some Christmas cooking. Did you? So, yeah, some Excellent. Lard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so uh, let me just um, point in the book, so if you go to uh, second edition of the book, uh, Primal Cure, page 103, there is a chart on page 104 of the smoking points of different uh, fats and oils. So basically what you're trying to do, it depends on what temperature you want to cook at, what oil is suitable. So exactly as Dr. Dan has just said, uh, careful with linseed oil, flaxseed oil, same thing, uh, because the, the smoking point's really low, so it's great for salad dressing, it's rich in omega-3, so it's fantastic for your health, but not if you cook with it, because you can really, you can turn healthy oils into unhealthy oils uh, if you go past the, the smoking point of the oil. So at the top of, you know, if you're really trying to make really hot cooking, uh, the very, very top is something called uh, avocado oil, uh, which has a smoking point of 271 degrees. And we come down to a uh, ghee, which is fantastic, olive oil, coconut oil, and then we come down to some of the other oils. And then sort of down the bottom, for example, don't really want to be cooking uh, at high temperature with butter, um, because that's somewhere between 120 and 150 degrees. Um, so yeah, ma uh, it's a great, great question. Um, it does matter uh, what you're cooking with, depending on uh, you know what type of cooking you do. Did doing. you mention olive oil? Which what was the temperature for olive oil? So olive oil. I think it's something that we're commonly told. Yeah. To so fry and and do roasts it, and stuff. Well, yeah, with, you can, we? and, it, and it varies based on what type of olive oil you're mm. using. I'm just trying to find the page in the book again now, but I think. But I think there are better, I think really with olive oil, there are better options yes. for, you know, high temperature cooking. So definitely. if you're roasting, you know, there, there are definitely better options <laughs> rather than... Can't find the page okay. in the book. <laughs> definitely rather than um, using uh, olive oil yeah. for that, really. Yeah, definitely. And coconut oil tastes just fantastic.
fantastic. <laughs> uh, and and uh, as uh, 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 Mr. Peterson said in his book, uh, Don't Jog, Eat Bacon, he said that olive oil is king, mm. but mm. God is the coconut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so hopefully, uh, 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 Eileen, that will answer your question. Right, Nancy has asked, and all the ladies this week, uh, Nancy has asked, uh, do you have any advice on nutrition relating to age-related macular degeneration or any supplements which I should be taking. Nancy. Okay, so I think we should start by defining what age-related macular degeneration is. I was, I was hoping you would do yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's probably good. It's, it's something we've heard of, uh, you know, a lot of people have heard of because it's a really important cause of sight loss. It doesn't cause blindness completely, but it, it's a very important source of, of sight loss in the UK. Um, and there's several different types, but what's the macula? Okay, so it's macular degeneration. Mm -hmm. So the macula is part of the back of the eye, which is the retina and the retina is where all your light sensitive cells are. Now the macula is the very very center of that uh, 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 the, the retina at the back of the eye and that is where the highest concentration of light sensitive cells are. So it's the bit that does your central vision, it's the most important bit of your vision and therefore when that macula degenerates it's going to cause us big problems with our vision. Yep. Okay. So, with regards to the different types, there's two different types. The most common type is called dry. So we've got wet and dry. Dry macular degeneration is, um, we don't really know what causes it. It's probably just kind of age related, you know, atrophy of the area. The second, um, type is called wet and that's mm -hmm. where we get new blood vessels forming at the back of the eye. Those blood vessels can burst and they actually can help the back of the eye start to peel away from itself. Mm -hmm. So that is only probably about 15 to 20 percent of macular degeneration yep. but it's the bit that causes pretty much total central blindness. Mm -hmm. So in terms of and quite rapidly as well. So in terms of uh, macular degeneration, that's the one that's, that's really nasty yep. because it causes the worst sight loss. Now there are some treatments in terms of things like lasers and stuff that can help with wet macular degeneration. So really, we can, we can really do some treatments for that. So we need to think about the dry side. Being big studies done in terms of nutrition and in terms of um, uh, supplements and stuff yep. for eyes, for uh, dry related macular degeneration. And there is some positive stuff that's come out of there. A really, really quite complicated supplement regimes. And they, have, they do have stuff like vitamin C, vitamin E, um, omega-3, all, we know they're all good for the eyes, yep. but there's also some kind of weird and wonderful ones in there that seem to make all the difference. Yeah, okay. there's two, and I can never remember the second one, it starts with an X, mm. um, and uh, leucine is another one. The thing you do, if you've got a copy of my cookbook, uh, Primal Gourmet, in the back I've decided to do a totally different style of index, and I broke down all the recipes we did and all the food types based on the different foods that could help, you know, for, for arthritis, for acne, for asthma. And I also looked at all the different foods, for example, for eyesight. Mm. So, you know, carrots really do help your mm. eyesight because of, you know, some of the, 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 the sort of the uh, elements that are inside uh, of carrots, but cauliflower, eggs, uh, paprika, uh, spring onions, onions, turnips, and watercress. Uh, some of the things that you might want to consume mm. lots and lots of mm. as well uh, for eyesight. And it's quite interesting that these sort of vegetables like uh, carrots and, and cauliflower, uh, turnips, watercress, they keep coming up time and time mm. again mm. as really good foods because you know, their chemical composition is such that you know, it's, it's like it's almost, they're almost listed in most preventative illnesses. Yeah, absolutely. And we see so many patterns emerging about what, what general good things and stuff. And, you know, our omega, omega threes, we know are also good for eyes and, and yeah. as well. Um, but back to the, so the, there is a lot of, you know, in terms of uh, general eye health, there's mm -hmm. lots of supplements and stuff, as you've just described, yeah. that are really, really good. But in, particularly in macular degeneration, there are 
there's a certain amount of specialist supplements that you can get specialist formulations for that may or may not be appropriate. Mm -hmm. And the best person to ad advise you on whether they may or may not be appropriate is your ophthalmologist because the only they know what type you've got and at what stage you're at. Yeah. It's not going to be beneficial for all people with all types of macular degeneration, okay? Mm -hmm. So really you've got to be guided by uh, your, your ophthalmologist on that. And also none of these supplements are available on the NHS, right. which I don't know why that is. If yeah. there was an evidence base for them, mm -hmm. I'd have thought that it would be, but um, yeah, uh, but I'm not really sure there. But for general eye health, you know, looking before that, you know, it's it's a, a lot of the same things that we're, you know, talking about. It's a lot of the same ingredients that yep. Steve's uh, uh, saying, and it, you know, it's so important to look after your eyes, really. What's what's your view on use it or lose it? I'll just sort of give you an example. So I wear contact lenses. Mm -hmm. As I've got older, I now have to wear reading glasses on top of my contact lenses more and more and more. Mm. And uh, some doctors have said to me. And some advisors actually the more you become lazy and just reach for your glasses in fact they're here somewhere you know, reach for your glasses too often um, some have said that your eyes become lazy therefore don't wear your reading glasses so much others have said completely the opposite which is well don't over strain your eyes because that's not good for your eyes mm -hmm. but uh, my guess would be actually isn't it, isn't it like building muscles in other parts of the body that really you know to the point of not actually going like crazy but mm -hmm. um, you should use it and try and avoid the glasses a little bit or not What's your view? Yeah, I, I, my view is I didn't know, so last time I went to the opticians, I asked my optician <laughs> because I was curious about exactly the same question. Right. Because you know, I, you know, I, I have very low level, you know, sight. Um, I, I need glasses a tiny little bit, and I'm at that kind of annoying stage where I don't have to reach for the glasses, and yeah. most of the time I don't. But occasionally, for you know, for computer work, it can help me to. To, if I'm working on the computer for a long period of time, yep. it's supposed to help me be less fatigued. They also say for driving at night that mm -hmm. I should be wearing them. But um, it was a, a mutual friend of ours, Sam, who, who okay. used to be my personal trainer, um, who, who would actually did some eye training work with me and, and we were doing some things looking from focusing from far to close. I don't know if we've ever done that yeah, with you, done that with him. Um, yep. these string things. Uh, and actually the idea is that yes, there is a certain amount of training that you can do with your eyes. Uh, and so, you know, the lens itself is the change in shape and the ability of the lens to focus is controlled by muscles. Mm -hmm. And so yes, those muscles can be trained. Mm -hmm. But the lens itself does suffer from you know, age-related stiffening. So the answer I got, I got a very balanced answer <laughs> from my optician. And she said that, yes, some people do believe that you, you, know, you can actually um, train this to a certain extent. Others believe you can't. But one of the statistics I believe was really, really in interesting I don't know what the significance of it was but uh, the people work who people who work in the countryside and are often looking into the distance need less in the way of glasses interesting which is really really interesting because if we think about it in majority of our day-to-day -day mm -hmm. life we're, we're looking at things that yep. are this distance and yep. very very close to us but <clears throat> imagine if you worked as a farmer or something in some beautiful part where you know we're up a hill somewhere yeah. and you were constantly, constantly. focusing yeah. in the distance then then actually you're giving your eyes a very different workout from mm -hmm. what you know perhaps you or I do on a or, day to day basis. Or playing devil's advocate it could be the fact we're looking at too much technology and the reason I say that is uh, in the uh, gem cutting uh, uh, houses that we own back in India where we cut gemstones I hardly ever see anybody wearing glasses that's cutting the stones and yet mm. they're adding like 57 facets on a diamond that might be like <laughs> three millimeters across the diameter mm. I can hardly even see the diamond and they're yeah. they're you know, all day putting facets on their eyesight is incredible because um, I part of me wants to agree with you completely that if you're always looking at the distance that's probably great but then that doesn't quite work with these guys that are cutting stones that I never see mm. wearing glasses but I also never see them using technology or watching television so yeah. it just it's, it's just fascinating but it was also it has also notoriously low uptake of glasses in India as well mm. uh, could as, be yeah, yeah so you're saying I've got wonky gemstones 
could be wrong. I have no, no idea. <laughs> so, so great, uh, great, great question, and uh, hopefully we've uh, shedded some light on that for you, uh, Nancy. Uh, and as we said, you know, there are certain supplements out there, but go and see a specialist. Um, Carol says, oh no, we've got Mark later on. I was going to say it's all ladies this week. Uh, if my child has been uh, immunized for flu and the kids around her haven't, uh, will her immunity be less effective? That's a great question. I think it boils down to the fact that there's two real reasons that we do immunizations, okay, or vaccinations, whatever you want to call them. Um, the first way, with flu, we are, we're really only targeting people who are gonna potentially get significant complications if they can contract the flu in their state of health, okay? So children and the elderly, they haven't got as many reserves in terms of fighting off the flu. Mm -hmm. So if children and the elderly get much worse flu than other people, yep. okay? So other conditions, so pregnancy, you don't wanna be getting the flu when you're pregnant. Yep. Um, with you've got asthma, you don't wanna be getting the flu. If you've got asthma, you've got much higher risk of ending up in hospital mm -hmm. with you know, complications. So really, the reason we vaccinate for flu is to stop, uh, to help prevent complications in at-risk groups, mm -hmm. okay? We also vaccinate um, healthcare professionals, really low uptake, I'm afraid, uh, in uh, healthcare professionals of the flu vaccine, uh, which I find crazy, uh, given that we expose ourselves so often to people yep. with the flu. Yep. Um, uh, and so, yeah, that's the reason we give things like the flu vaccination, same with things like the shingles vaccination, which we give uh, to older adults because when you get the shingles, uh, when you're older, you're less likely to be able to fight it off and you're much likely to get worse disease. But that's very, very different from things like, you know, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, all those kind of diseases, smallpox and things that we've pretty much managed to mm -hmm. eradicate. And what we're trying to do there is, yes, prevent the individual from getting there, but by vaccinating everybody throughout the population, we are hoping to prevent will create what we call herd immunity, yep. where basically everybody is immune to it. So the illness mm -hmm. just dies out yep. because you know we rely on transmission from people to person to person mm -hmm. for these illnesses to spread. And that actually, you know, we should be um, basically trying to get rid of these diseases. And you know, I'm I'm going to get on my soapbox here. I don't understand the anti-vaccination movement. Mm -hmm. There's been some real damage done by you know the the doctor who did the <coughs> the really bad science. And, and for people who've not, you know, we, they'll probably have heard of the MMR scandal a few yep. years ago and the link to autism. Yep. If you never heard the update about that, the guy who did that science was struck off the medical register. Okay, there was never any. Um, never any truth behind his yeah. claims. I mean, I mean, there's a few doctors in America, isn't there, that are yeah. totally anti-vaccination. They mm. bring up charts that try and say, well, look, you know, we, 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 kids, we're like giving them 15 or 20 different jabs in the States, mm. and actually you can track that to other illnesses. Yeah. But the whole point is the things that used to wipe us out have pretty much disappeared. Exactly. So. And, we, you know, we have to, which is why, we, you know, if you forget history, you yep. never learn, do you? Yeah. Because you know, we have to remember that, you know, a hundred years ago or so, you know, the Spanish flu, yep. you know, wiped out half of my grandmother's family well, at a young age, yep. you know, my grandmother's brother died at three years old because of the Spanish flu. And that's not uncommon, Yes, but that is very uncommon these days yes. because yes. we have these programs in place. Mm -hmm. Now, flu is, is different, as I mentioned earlier, but smallpox and, and all these kind of other measles, and measles and that, measles you know, we, we essentially, these are essentially illnesses that don't exist. And we get very, very worried when we yep. start to see rises in measles and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but we've got to remember that these, these diseases, not only like polio and things like that, these diseases, there's still people, I still meet people with polio occasionally, and I'm no doubt when you go on your travels to yep. India, yep. polio is still a massive, massive Agreed. problem. Yep. Um, 
in India because they've still not really got on top of that problem. Mm -hmm. But it's so rare in the UK. But the amount of disability that polio causes people is 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 quite shocking, really. Mumps um, and and things like that, you know, can cause infertility. So you know, if you you're not vaccinating your children for mumps, if they get mumps as a teenager and then they they're wondering why they can't have children in yep. their 20s yep. then you know these are the decisions you're making by not vaccinating the children we went off on a massive tangent there uh, carol but i think a really important one uh because you know the internet and google all these things are fantastic mm. but you can the you know, one bit of uh bad advice can then just get out of control and also the mm. whole industry can be talking or, or it appears like everybody's anti-vaccination yeah. uh, and yet really it just comes from this one little movement and, and, and I think what we just heard from you, which is great because we've never had this conversation before that you know they're there for a reason and therefore you know try when it's on offer for you especially vulnerable groups with Definitely. the flu uh, if it's on offer for you go get it and it doesn't actually mean that you're not going to get flu it no. just means the chances of, i'm right on that one isn't it yeah you're absolutely I mean, right i had, I had a flu vaccination last year and i still got the flu and <laughs> this is why well, i will always get the flu vaccination and yeah. it actually even if you're not in one of the eligible groups for the flu vaccination, you can go into your pharmacy and get it for 12 quid really? or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, you can go and get it even if you're not yep. uh, in one of these at-risk groups. If you just, because it's rubbish. I lost, yep. I lost February this year because of the flu. I was yep. in bed for three weeks. It was, it was pretty terrible. And, Flu is, is rubbish. But back to the vaccination, we, we rely, it, not for the flu, but for the other side of things, we rely on getting everybody immunised. And even if just a small portion of the population don't get immunised, then we lose that herd immunity. Mm. And that's why I'm so passionate, yeah. because we need everybody on board with yeah. it. And we need everybody to be getting everyone vaccinated to prevent these horrific illnesses into the history books. So I think we answered your question, Karen. If we haven't, I'll just reiterate that uh, if your child's had it and the kids around haven't, uh, you, your child is less likely to get the flu because your child's been vaccinated, yeah. but it still doesn't mean it's impossible for them mm. to get the flu. So encourage and spread that word yeah. that we don't think vaccinations have the negative effects. We think it's great and try and encourage the mums at school. And even if, you know, people around you aren't uh, as Dr. Dan says, you know, eligible for the free vaccination, you can get it from uh, your pharmacy. So great advice. Love there's that a, one. There's a lovely video. Do you know Penn and Teller, the American, uh, they're uh, magicians. If anyone wants to watch, explain to people why vaccinations is important, I'm going to show you this video after the, uh, the okay. show. Penn and Teller vaccinations on YouTube. Go and have a look at that video. It's absolutely fantastic. And that, that, that sort of makes you want to get vaccinated absolutely. when it's on offer. Absolutely. It's a very well done video. Heard it here first. Uh, right. Um, from Mark. I knew we'd have a gentleman at least one this week. Uh, I am a fit and healthy 30-year-old. I'm lean and regularly exercise. Why do I sweat so much of a night time? Good question. Okay. So... The medical term for this is called hyperhidrosis, okay? So excessive, and that would be defined as excessive sweating, but you have to have a, a cool room, okay? You, you know, if you've got excessive sweating at and, night- And it's 80 and, degrees. And it's, you know, ridiculously hot in your bedroom yeah. and you've got four blankets on top, yeah. that's not hyperhidrosis, yeah. okay? That's just being silly. So <laughs> we have to be sure that, that you know, you're in, obviously getting a cool temperature in your room yeah. and you really shouldn't be above like 19 degrees in your bedroom, yeah. okay? This is a very common thing I see. See, a lot of people come in, what kind of sleep, doctor? Why can't I sleep? One of the, reasons there's many many reasons you know caffeine and screen exposure yep. and all these kind of things yep. but one of the reasons is the room's just too warm yep. too warm and so yeah get the room cool get yep. yourself an appropriate sleeping great way to help lose weight as well colder room absolutely yeah so uh, very very important from that perspective but i don't think that's what he's got you mm -hmm. know this is a this is a well chap yep. and i'm assuming this is going on for a while because actually if that's a new symptom definitely something you want to be going and seeing your doctor about as a as an urgent uh, matter because things that can cause night sweats um, can vary in severity from you know thyroid disease right through to to cancers tuberculosis and things like that okay but I'm going to assume that he's had this for a long while yep 
bad news is for the majority of people, this is just a something that happens, okay? Mm -hmm. This is just something that people experience. What we call primary hyperhidrosis can be localized. Some people get it just in the armpit, some people get it all over. Um, but there really isn't a lot known about why it happens. But there are some things that you'll need to go and see your doctor to get them excluded. We're talking about things like um, diabetes mm -hmm. can cause excessive sweating. Uh, we are talking about things like thyroid disease, like I mentioned earlier, can really disrupt our body's ability to thermoregulate itself. But, um, but really, as long as those have been ruled out, the question is then, well, where do we go with this? There are, my experience is that that actually we can get a referral to a dermatologist who can suggest certain treatments, you know, if it's very localized, mm -hmm. uh, um, what's it called, Botox, mm -hmm. to certain areas could, can be one of the options. There are other different options as well, um, but my experience is trying to get them funded on the NHS is very, very difficult. And it's a real shame, actually. Um, and I think, obviously, we've got people in powers that be who are making decisions about the the um, the effectiveness of the treatments. And you know, a lot of kind of not what they call cosmetic stuff mm -hmm. really isn't available on the NHS. Yep. Oh, I want that mole removed because it's on my face and looks unsightly. Yep. You know, you shouldn't be getting that removed on the NHS. Yep. Um, that would be a private thing, yep. really. And I think there's this viewpoint that that hyperhidrosis, this excessive sweating, would be would kind of fall under that category. I, I, if it happens occasionally, mm. <clears throat> isn't that, if it just happens occasionally, if I've had one or two glasses of wine too much, mm. I sweat like crazy, yeah, that's just the body sometimes doing its job, isn't yeah, it? You've got, got toxins gone in, yeah. the job of the body, you know, one mm. of the reasons I'm completely anti uh, antiperspirants is you're trying to stop the body from sweating mm. in an area where it's designed to sweat to, to remove toxins. Yeah, yeah quite seen dangerous. Block, sweat, sweat glands and all sorts of stuff from yeah. from that really. But um, but you're saying that, that so the occasion of occasionally happening when it's something too much toxins going in, yeah. whatever reason that's understandable. You're saying that there is uh, actually a a condition if it's happening regularly and and you haven't got toxins going in regularly and and, and, yeah. and the room's not too warm it could be you just need to go and get that checked basically yeah you, in the first instance you definitely need to get checked because there's some obvious things that need to be ruled out yeah. in terms of treatments not really available on the nhs in my experience maybe in some other places but it does cause a lot of people a lot of misery you know will stop people entering entering sexual relationships for example because they're so embarrassed about how much they sweat yeah. they don't want to be kind of you know seen naked basically yeah. uh, will cause people issues at work mm -hmm. um, because they're you know they they get shy about these kind of things and actually can lead to depression as well so I don't think it's something that needs to be yeah it should be taken lightly and it yeah. actually really does have quite a profound impact on some people great question mark I hope that's mm. uh, answered uh, 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 that nicely for you um, and again, thank you for all your questions. Remember, what we do is that uh, every Monday, uh, Dr. Dan or Dr. Shan will be here to answer your questions. You can uh, send us in questions on the website. Uh, you can send questions in on the website. At the very bottom of primalcure.com, there's an a, a area there for you to ask the doctors. But try and, I mean, the questions we've read out today are the sort of questions we love. Um, don't try and ask questions that really, you know, don't wait for us to answer your question if you think it's something you need to go and see your GP about, always mm. see your GP. Or, so what I found fascinating in the last couple of weeks is that both yourself and Dr. Shan, there's quite a lot of conditions you can actually go and see your pharmacy for and maybe, you know, cut down the amount of people that are, that are visiting. You know, we know all your surgeries are under a mass amount of stress at the yeah. moment. We're a, a, a overall a not very well nation. but. I've been fascinated by how many times yourself and Dr. Shannon said that, that yeah, sometimes just go and see your pharmacy. You know, they're well trained, they've got access to lots of yeah. uh, advice there as well. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the simple stuff, the simple over the counter stuff, um, you know, warts, verrucas, you know, these kind of things that we get a lot of people coming to see us about, they can, they largely never need to come to us unless they're really treatment resistant. Um, and, you know, there's a, 
so you have a look in your pharmacy next time you're in there, even if you're going around mm -hmm. the supermarket and there's a pharmacy there, there's usually big posters up because they're desperate to try yep. and get people <laughs> into these, uh, you know, to try and keep people away from yep. GPs. But it, it's not, it's a really difficult thing, Steve. Um, you know, telling people to essentially self-select where they go, yeah. whether it's, yeah. you know, and I remember a, a few, uh, a couple of three years ago, there was a, uh, there's adverts on buses all around uh, Coventry and Warwickshire mm -hmm. which were showing people with a range of different conditions and their strap line was none of these people needed to be an A&E and you've got a guy who's crunched over in, in cri looks like crippling abdominal pain and you're thinking you're telling people not with severe abdominal pain not to go to A and E. Well, right. what if that guy's got appendicitis? Yeah. What if he's got a ruptured yeah. a aortic aneurysm? Yeah. You know, I think it's it's a really difficult thing, and it's a big problem we have to sort out yeah. uh, nationally. Mm -hmm. Is how we get people to go and access services because it's very difficult for us as doctors who are medically trained to say, well, of course it's appropriate for you to be here. Of course it's not appropriate for you yeah. to be here. Of course you should have gone to A and E about this. You know, it's easy for me to be saying this thing, but it's not, you know, yeah. easy for the general public to be making these decisions. But and it is complicated, isn't it? Because I've heard you so many times, mm. and Dr. Shan as well, saying, look, if you're not well, come and see us. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, you know, you're in one of the most overstressed public health um, yeah. businesses, if you like, uh, organizations on the planet. Yeah. And yet you still keep saying, if you're not feeling well, do come and see us. And, yeah. and it, 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 too many people are too embarrassed to go and see the doctors, and, and you know, yeah. you feel a lump somewhere. Go and see your doctor, oh, you know, and things yeah. like that. Whereas, but also just to stop one second of thought: is it something I can go and see my pharmacist about? Yeah, absolutely. A second of thought, and then if you're still not sure, get a doctor. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and I know there's there's, a, there's initiatives towards um, getting the internet involved with this, and you know having an NHS website. I don't know what stage that is. I was at a GP big GP conference a couple of years ago, and saying that you know they want to create some sort of unifying resource to help patients decide where they should go. But to my knowledge, that's not up and ready. Well, we're having, moment. as you know, uh, the Primary Cure uh, conference coming up uh, in March with some of the top, top doctors in the UK. Let's put that on the agenda of see if we can suggest something to the NHS. Mm. Uh, I've got a, you, you touched on something a second ago. We've got a few minutes left. Verrucas, what causes them? What can we do with our kids? Because my kids love going swimming. Is it, it, do seasons make any difference? What's the best thing to avoid Verrucas and what do we do if we have a Veruca? Good question, right. So what is a Veruca? Basically, a Veruca is a wart that's on your foot. And the reason it looks different is because you're pressing it and it's right. going inwards rather yeah. than outwards. So if you've got a I water on your hands. I did not know that. Yeah. So did not know that. Yeah, same thing. It's, yeah. They're caused by a little viral thing, really. And, yeah. and for that reason, you know, if you've got warts on your hands, very easy to transmit them around yeah. to other areas of the body. And, uh, and so moisture will also really help that transmission. So yeah. that's why... I used to go swimming a lot as a kid. I had loads of rukas during my childhood. And that's one of the reasons we say, you know, like ch changing towels and things like that, mm -hmm. standing on a towel at the, yeah. uh, at the uh, swimming pools and yeah. things like that. But really, there isn't a huge amount you can do to stop them. But they're not anything to be concerned about in particular. Mm -hmm. um, Again, your pharmacist can help you with these kind of things. Um, there's some great advice online about um, on the NHS website, various creams. The thing is, you just have to be patient and persistent with them because mm -hmm. they take a, a long, long, long time to, to go and get rid of. And you need to be you know, fairly you know, intense. You know, they will go eventually if yeah. you just leave them, but it could be several years down the line. Yeah. And they can be really, really uncomfortable. Um, but there's various treatments for them. Uh, the most common are the creams and, um, mm -hmm. and things. You can, I believe, get almost like they're like freeze at home kits now. Right, okay. Um, which was a new one on me when somebody told those about them. Doctors can freeze them off, but we don't like doing it as a, it, there's really a last resort mm -hmm. because it's really, really painful yep. to have a bit of your skin yep. frozen on your foot. Yep. You know, the first thing that will happen, it's like you were giving a localized <coughs> frostbite. Yep. The first thing that will happen is that area will swell up and get damaged and become really, really painful. And if your kid's trying to walk around on that, yep. that's really, really painful. So, you know, be, bear in mind that if we, you know, I do see some parents getting a bit 
upset and angry about this, um, you know, that we're not offering this treatment straight away. But bear in mind, we are doing all the best we can. So great advice, great one we just threw in there today, it wasn't from a customer, it was from my own peace of mind with kids. Don't overly panic about it. Mm. First of all, the pharmacy, and then if you still can't get it sorted at the pharmacy, then maybe your doctor. Yeah. So uh, there you go, a little random one thrown in. And uh, keep your questions coming in, uh, thick and fast. And uh, if you uh, want to see questions that have happened in the past, we are about to load them all up onto YouTube, uh, with a little database where you can uh, have a little search maybe before you go to the pharmacy or the doctor. Thank you very much uh, for being with us uh, this afternoon.